Okay, 81, 83 people. Ninety-eight. Who's going to be the hundredth person? Hundred. We'll just wait for a, a couple more seconds before we start. See how it goes. So people are still joining. We'll wait a few more seconds. Okay, so let's get going with this webinar. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the webinar um, entitled Building Public Support for Biomedical Research and the Critical Role of Animal Studies. I'll be the moderator today, introducing the speakers and um, looking after the discussion at the end. And my name is Dennis Brown. I'm the Chief Science Officer for the American Physiological Society. Sure. I also run a lab at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School where I do quite a bit of, of, of animal research on kidney function. So um, today's session is, we think, a unique collaboration between APS, the American Physiological Society, and our partners at Techniplast, at the Americans for Medical Progress, and the North American Three Hours Collaborative. And I'd like to thank all of these co-sponsors for bringing us all together um, to talk about this importance and the importance of animal models in biomedical research. Before we get started, and people are still um, are still joining the webinar, but before we get started, we'd like to throw up a little poll um, to ask you a couple of questions about uh, your use of animals. So um, if you could please respond to the poll, we'd like to get to know a little bit more about you and about the audience. So the first one, you can see what are our research models of interest, if you could just answer this question. Okay, here we go. So as we can see, as presumably be expected, a, a lot of interest in uh, mouse and rat models. Um, but also quite a few with rabbits, non-human primates, human research, obviously zebrafish, and cells and tissue. So um, the whole gamut really, but with a focus on the small uh, rodent models. So thank you very much for that. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, tell you at this point that we ask you, we would ask you to refrain from actually doing screen captures or videos of the presentations, either partly or in whole or in part. Uh, the session will be recorded and will be available for future use, so really no need to do any, any recording yourselves. The recording, I just remind you of photographs of another person's presentation without their explicit permission is actually prohibited, so please don't do that. Um, at this time, all of the attendees, and we have quite a lot of attendees now, 
they're all in listen-only mode with video off. And as moderator, though, I'll be happy to, 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 to raise questions that are typed into the chat. So if you have any questions, type them into the chat and we'll get to them, probably not all of them because there'll be, there'll be uh, too many, I think. But type your questions into the chat, we'll sort through them and then we'll go through those um, probably at the end of the session. So the session we have until 3 p.m. Um, we expect the speakers to go to maybe about 2.20, 2.30, um, something like that. And then we'll see how it goes with the question and answer session. Depending on that, we'll, uh, we, we can finish early or we may finish until uh, three o'clock. So it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the first speaker, Dr. Edison Liu. He's a professor emeritus, uh, a professor and president emeritus, and honorary fellow at the Jackson Laboratories. And we're all jealous, Ed, about that because it's such a beautiful place. Um, um, I go every year up to Bar Harbor to the Mount Desert Island Labs, and we know what a gorgeous place it is up there. So um, we're all jealous of you being up there. He's known for his work on the functional genomics of, of human breast cancer, and he's a pioneer in translational cancer medicine. He's published over 340 scholarly papers, and he serves as the CEO of the Jackson Lab up there. Um, he's also held positions at the National Cancer Institute, and the Genome Institute of Singapore. Thank you for being with us today um, and welcome. We look forward to hearing your talk, Dr. Liu. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. It's really a great honor for me to be here. Uh, and I look forward to um, the discussion that will follow. I hope you can see my slides. I just want to make sure. Yeah, yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, you know, just for definition purposes, I will concentrate my talk on animals in research as a surrogate for the human condition, uh, not the, the larger, the broader uh, uh, category of studying total biology, which spans anywhere from insects and, and, uh, um, and the entire animal kingdom, or animals as a surrogate for human safety. Now, um, to start out with, I think we recognize that in the last 50 years as scientists, we've concentrated on looking at the, the really the root causes of disease. Um, originally, the doctor would say the patient is sick. The scientist would ask what systems affected, what's the process that goes on. That's um, often our translational scientists. And then our basic scientists will take that and ask the root causes. And in the last 50 years, the major contribution is that we found genetic origins on the majority of diseases. And with the identification of these genetic um, origins, we can now construct the solutions in the organism itself. There's no disease entity that is more affected by this than the so-called rare and orphan diseases, which is a misnomer because there's at least 7,000 different genetic diseases with 30 million Americans affected by them. And every disease is different from the other with a significant challenge of having very few patients actually being affected, gratefully on one hand, but experimentally it makes it difficult to find solutions. As a cancer biologist myself and a cancer geneticist, I now know, uh, we now know through sequencing that every cancer is an orphan disease because it's a unique combination of the mutations that are there. Uh, an example of how we've uh, parlayed our technologies is we find the offending mutation now by sequencing. And we prove that a mutation causes diseases in an animal model. And then we uh, use the best model we possibly can to test the treatment, um, if a treatment works. And then because of the small number of cases, we use phase two clinical trials. And at the Jackson Labs, we've worked with the Spinal Muscular Atrophy Foundation for many years to find the solution to this um, very serious problem. It is one about um, a neuro uh, degeneration of the motor neurons. And the majority of, 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 un of unfortunate <clears throat> individuals affected <clears throat> die within <clears throat> two years. Some will survive, but they are severely handicapped and ultimately will have a foreshortened life. The sequencing told us that it was a mutation in the SMN1 gene, and there's two, two different forms of an SMN gene. The one that is active is SMN1, the one that is a, a form Frust is SMN2, which is really evolutionarily an appendage. Um, it produced a mostly a non-functional protein, but because we because scientists knew how to uh, what the error was in SMM2, they found ways to convert an um, a, 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 active protein to an active one. 
And what, um, what was found by some very, um, very smart scientists um, is that uh, antisense oligonucleotides that bind to specific regulatory splicing uh, signals in the SMN2 gene can actually reconfigure the gene so that it becomes a full protein. Now, the full protein is not um, absolutely fully active, but it's enough to compensate for the S loss of SMN1. Now, the big problem is then how do you test this? And uh, just having a knockout is clearly not enough. And so consequently, um, we worked with the scientific community and the SMN, uh, SMA Foundation, developed the master um, uh, prototype for the animal model. And this is just an example of the complexity of this construction. Once it was constructed, we showed beyond a shadow of a doubt within the window of therapeutic uh, uh, opportunity that we can convert death in these uh, models, as you see in the green line, to absolutely um, cure and survival. And give you an example, the SMA um, uh, animal is unfortunately runted and small. Um, the SMA um, with treatment is the same size as the black mouse, which is a, a, a litter mate, um, showing that there is complete restoration of function. Based on these preclinical studies and then early uh, clinical trial, uh, uh, the clinical trials, Spinraza was approved by the FDA for treatment, and it converted the disease that you see here to one of this individual with SMA um, treated at birth with Spinraza, and you can see that she's leading a normal life. Now, you multiply this by hundreds and thousands of folds, and what you see um, is that we have even more powerful solution to this. And you've heard of CRISPR-Cas where this approach can actually correct the fundamental mutation that is there. Here, we can generate models uh, uh, in a absolutely facile manner and potentially help the, um, the, the, the therapist guide new treatments for the treatment. Uh, of these diseases, genetic disorders. And the most recent um, excitement is that a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing um, appears to work for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, opening up a fantastic new horizon for medicine. I told you about how individual genes can affect diseases, but most diseases uh, are affected by multiple genes either simultaneously or, um, or in tandem with each other. And the key issue here is how to, to, to compute, how do they interact with each other, and then use um, model systems in, uh, uh, in conjunction with human studies to, to find the, uh, the ultimate solutions. In cancer, the major uh, example of this recently is the discovery of the checkpoint inhibitors that is now the rage of cancer treatment because we now can convert deadly diseases into absolute cures. Um, Jim Allison and, and uh, Tasuko uh, Hanjo um, discovered CTLA-4 and, P and PD-1, which are checkpoint inhibitors that block your immune system from killing the cancer cells that are in, in us. Um, in the seminal paper in 1996, Jim Allison and his group identified CTLA-4 and proved um, beyond a shadow of a doubt in a mouse, a mouse model system that this therapy actually works. This was done through decades uh, from not only Allison's laboratory, but many other laboratories using the mouse human interface as the, um, as the test bed to find the core of these molecules. Translating into that is um, the combination therapy of anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 that has converted an, um, a death sentence of metastatic melanoma into a uh, almost 50% cure rate, an unprecedented um, conversion uh, in a deadly disease. And we are going to see more of this, but the essentiality of, of having a model system that can actually precede the clinical trial becomes absolutely important. We've taken this one step further at the Jackson Lab in using genetic tools and genetic tricks. We've actually uh, created panels of um, genetically diverse mice that can accept these uh, specific cancer models to map the genes, host genes that are responsible for response or non-response. As you saw in the survival curve, 
that were cured, 50% continue to die. Why is that the case? This is the biggest question in immuno-oncology today. And the biggest problem is that we don't have a model system to be able to test this. We just created one. And what we found was that host genetics uh, contributes to anywhere between 20 to 40% of the variances in response uh, to anti-PD-1 therapeutics. Because of this approach, we're now in the process of mapping the host genes responsible for response. And we have candidates that we're um, chasing after at this point. I wanna move to um, uh, the, uh, the core of the reason why we're here. And that is, um, how do we explain animal experimentation to the public? Um, and we can't do that without understanding the history of human experimentation. I wanna take, for example, the idea of, of um, human cadaveric dissection, um, which by the way, started in the third century in Greece with Herophilus and uh, his, his disciples. And for 1,500 years, um, these texts were the core of all of medicine. When during the middle ages, um, dissection of humans was considered blasphemous and therefore prohibited both culturally and in a religious um, manner. Papal decrees uh, actually prohibited um, the, the, the use of, of humans uh, in, in dissections uh, at that time. Well, in the 1400s, as Renaissance was revving up, um, the, the, the cultural acceptance of discovery and art and the acceptance that the human body can be beautiful changed uh, this significantly. And of course, we all know Leonardo da Vinci not only drew beautiful pictures, but was also a masterful dissector. Um, he and some of his contemporaries did active dissections and drew those dissections as well. In fact, in 1537, Pope Clement actually had a decree that allowed for dissection for anatomical studies, which opened the floodgates. And this is a picture from Leiden, University of Leiden, that dissection not only became the foundation of medical studies, but also a spectator sport as well. Now, um, where did he get the bodies? Um, and in the first um, 1500 years, it was about, it was on executed criminals. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in the 1600s, because of the, of the opening up of dissection, they couldn't find enough bodies. And, and so post-mortems um, where, where um, individuals passed away and the physician says, I'd like to do the, the post-mortem um, took place. And then of course, you've heard of the nefarious grave robbing. Um, in fact, what had happened is that experimentation was considered a part of punishment. It, that was codified in 1752 in England in the Murder Act, which says part of the punishment of a, of a convicted murderer is not only execution, but also dissection in the hands of, of uh, physicians in training. Now in the 1800s, um, it moved to unclaimed bodies and unfortunately the vulnerable were in the poorhouses. Um, and in the uh, 1832, there was a major shift in mindset where the Anatomy Act uh, provided for donations of bodies uh, to be a source. And that was the first concept of donating your body to science. And of course, today in medical school, the only bodies we uh, dissect are donations. Uh, that was of course um, uh, reinforced by Anatomy uh, Act of 1848 and in Japan, the body donation law. In fact, we, we build upon this um, as, as, as physicians with ceremonies of respect where the bodies are no longer disposed, but they're buried, where, um, where uh, young physicians are asked to have a moment of silence for the cadavers that they have dissected. And in one medical school in the United States, the medical students actually meet in advance of their dissection, the families uh, of the individual who donated the body for, for dissection. Well, at one point we moved from experimentation as punishment to experimentation on the unwanted in society to experimentation as a gift. Um, think about this, the, the act of dissection is the same, but the context is completely different. And you talk about clinical trials, um, the first thousand years was built on paternal, paternalism of a physician or a scientist in medical practice that really uh, got into a fever pitch with atrocities of the Nazis where sadism and paternalism coincided. 
Uh, and then this, the very disappointing and sad and immoral uh, acts of the Tuskegee uh, syphilis studies, which then promulgated um, reactions of the Nuremberg Code and the Belmont, Belmont Report. These uh, are these, um, these principles that we still live by. Um, then in the 2000 beyond, we now are at the phase of viewing clinical trials as, uh, as a right. Uh, at the beginning, it was about centered on science and scientists per se, as the premier, um, um, uh, you know, the premier leader or the premier thinker and the actor in this to the center of clinical trials as something for the patient and not just for the scientists alone. This has been embedded in our culture, gratefully, so that in 1975, the Asilomar Conference was voluntarily pulled together by scientists to address the benefits and risks of genetically modifying um, microorganisms like E. coli. This was not promulgated by um, an, uh, an act. This was uh, because scientists finally understood the issue of respect and responsibility. At the Jackson Labs, we take this very seriously, and for us, we should as well. Of course, we have regulatory requirements like IUCOC um, uh, committees, um, but we also think that incorporating respectful actions within the institution and respectful intentions in our work life are key. And party to that has to be a change in language and change in our narrative to ourselves and to outside. At Jax, one of the key things we did was to and put a formal program to weave compassion into in, in animal care into the fabric of our culture. A culture is difficult. Um, I don't think we had to change much, but we want to solidify it as strong as we possibly could. We, we put work protocols in place that focus on compassionate use. For example, when the, when the mouse cages are cleaned, the individuals who are responsible for the cleaning of the cages if they see a, um, a neonatal mouse somehow um, uh, remaining in that, the mouse is put in a special box, the whole process is stopped, um, and the, um, the entire chain of command along a, a chain of custody of that, of, that, uh, of that box is noted that this has happened and this should never happen again. We take these, um, these infractions very seriously. There's a series of events, um, video series, small group discussions, where we talk about their feelings, our workers' feelings about working with animals and the issue of compassion fatigue has always come up. Our key message is the use of mice in biomedical research is critical for everybody's lives because of medical process. But very importantly, we are stewards of this precious resource. We hammer home two words, stewards. That's our responsibility and precious resource uh, rather than just animals for experimentation. And then in our communications, we've enlisted um, uh, the, uh, some of our, uh, of our greatest proponents who are not scientists. First of all, we view all our employees as ambassadors. So we give them uh, all, the, all the necessary information that they can tell a compelling story to their family and their friends. Our external message mirrors our internal messaging. We give compelling stories of impact. We're constantly busting myths and disinformation, and we reinforce this message of responsibility and stewardship. To the right is a perfect example. Caroline is actually a young woman with a, um, a neuromuscular disorder, and we created a mouse model specifically with her mutation. Um, her family is a donor in the, in, uh, for Jackson Laboratory, and she and her family has volunteered to uh, propagate the message of how important our work with animal models are. This is powerful messaging, not from a scientist, from, but a recipient of the benefits of, of our science. Changing the lexicon is important. We no longer call an adult man a boy. Um, that is um, not accepted and rightfully so. And of course, we don't call human experimentation experimentation. They're called clinical trials. It's not just lexicon, it's actually the actions that go along with it. And at Jackson Laboratories, we don't call our animals experimental animals. We call them uh, model systems for human disease. Our veterinary colleagues have moved along with this as well. Um, and they are moving their experimentation into clinical trials, uh, embracing not only the um, 
the the fact that the the therapies they give in trials are beneficial, many of them are beneficial, but also they're engaging the owners of the animals as um, in the as, as participants uh, in these trials as well. Well, you know, we talked about uh, all the actions that we can do, but one of which prospectively is that we have to recognize as a, community, as a community that social norms are changing just as much as I've shown you, social norms have changed around human experimentation, what's allowed and what is not allowed. And I think we must change as well. Now there's a raging debate about whether or not we should even uh, use chimpanzees uh, and, and non-human primates as, as experimental systems. Um, I won't get into that. But um, at JAX, there are reasons why we, we don't really need the experimental, uh, the revolutionary, uh, the evolutionary proximity for some of the work that we do. And what we have done is actually, we and others have done is actually engineer the mouse so that they're more human-like in the uh, disorders or in the physiology that we're interested in. A big one, of course, is engineering, re-engineering the genome of the immune system so that they resemble the, um, uh, the human condition. And in fact, many of the uh, monoclonal antibodies that are used, uh, that are now out for COVID-19 were generated primarily in mice that have been humanized in the immune system. At JAX, we actually have immunodeficient mice that have human components of the immune system and the hematopoietic system. And these have been extraordinarily valuable in things from vaccines, um, to CAR T cell um, biology, to, cytok to mapping cytokine storm, um, to infectious disease, um, um, uh, to infectious disease biology. In fact, many of the hepatitis C um, work that has been done by Charlie Rice was done with these so-called humanized mice, which I think is not a great name, um, but this is uh, stuck. Now at JAX, we also believe that the, a virtual model will come to pass. No virtual model is perfect, but we're working towards that with the understanding that we cannot know everything about a human being, but we can know a lot about a mouse in a particular disease order. By using advanced genomic and computational tools, we can construct the vectors of responsibility of physiology, port them over in the humans and repopulate the human model. Um, we have done this in the last two and a half years as an experiment on type two diabetes in a massive way um, and merge this information, the mouse information with human information to develop a virtual model of physiology um, that uh, can be used to, to project new treatments and new diagnostics. And in fact, the massive amounts of data has attracted many other um, uh, scientists, including astrophysicists from Harvard and Smithsonian who on the left on their day job, um, you know, reconstructs the universe in 3D. What they've done for us here on the right is reconstruct all the genes involved in type two diabetes in a three-dimensional construct um, that would appear within the nucleus of a cell. Now, you know, the most uh, interesting advance at this point has been the engineering of the pig uh, into more human-like framework. And you know what I'm talking about because it's front and center um, in the recent months. It's about pig to human heart transplant. And um, the first transplant has taken place and the individual has, is still alive um, uh, with the pig heart. This is going to be a very uh, monumental change in the concept of how to deal with animal experimentation um, in animal models. For the very first time, very much like our work with Caroline with a neuromuscular disease, the experimentation in this animal model has actually a direct effect on a human life, not an abstract one, not a one that we pass the goodness through increasing knowledge, but actually changing human lives. Um, we'll see what this will lead, but we, need, we should be prepared for it. What do we need to do for the future? Obviously we need as a community to constantly con counter irrational extremism. Misinformation is rampant in the, in the web and we need to not do it in a piecemeal manner, but in a concerted manner. But I think very importantly, and the, the, the cornerstone of this meeting is to reconsider our communication strategy. Dare I say that scientists are not the greatest communicators. And one thing we've learned in the last 20 years is that we have to be much better um, um, and have a consistent message. Um, 
And lastly, as I've shown you, we need to embrace rational change. Um, our approach to model systems um, will have to uh, change over time. There will be perhaps more restrictions. We just have to be smarter in terms of how to um, explore new avenues, uh, not to experiment in animals, but to advance science, which is really our core message going forward. So I wanna thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of this uh, seminar. So thanks uh, enormously, Ed, for, for that uh, wonderful introduction and um, lecture at the beginning. And it's really important and interesting, I think, to follow the history of, of, of the process to, to see where we, where we end up now, and you did that remarkably well, and also showed us a bit of the vision of the future. Um, just one sad thing that I'd like to add, and, and someone put this in the, in, in, the, in the poll, is that David Bennett, the recipient of the pig transplant, actually died yesterday. Um, so that was an unfortunate, but but nonetheless, this was in fact a remarkable uh, procedure, and I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that uh, as, as as we move forward. So uh, with that, I'd like now to welcome our second speaker, Jim Newman. He's the director for strategic communications at Americans for Medical Progress. Um, he leads the media and communication program, and this is focused on outreach with the goal of building an understanding and, and appreciation. Uh, for the humane use of, of animals in, in research. So I'd like to welcome Jim and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Let me go ahead and get my slides ready to go here. And hopefully uh, if someone can confirm that my slides are showing, that would be great. Yes, they're, they're fine. Excellent, excellent. So we'll, we'll move forward then. Uh, so just a, a brief uh, addition to who I am and why is this person speaking to you? My name is Jim Newman. I'm the, as, uh, as introduced, the communications director for Americans for Medical Progress. Uh, my, I have a deep love of science. I've been involved in science communications for um, over 20 years now. Uh, I worked, uh, I, my past work included some work at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So I actually had the, uh, the excitement of working um, with Dr. Allison, who was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, and that was a really exciting experience. And then prior to that, I also served as the communications director, I should say the media relations director for both the Oregon National Primate Research Center and Oregon Health and Science University. And so in those roles, a lot of experience communicating about science and specifically uh, animals in science, but also a lot of um, experience dealing with the other side of that coin, which is responding to animal activism, the claims that were made about research, trying to uh, correct the record as, as best we could, and uh, a lot of lessons learned from that that will hopefully be reflected in, in what we see here. Um, so I, I thought it might be helpful to begin with a, a slide, and I, I assume others might reference um, poll data, so I'm going to do this very briefly, but why research organizations and specifically scientists should communicate about the important role of animals is um, an important question to ponder. And so one of the, the big responses to that question is why should scientists become involved in this and why should institutions um, become more involved in communicating about animal research is because public opinion is a major concern. These are, these are the results of a, a poll that's done pretty regularly by Gallup and they poll on a variety of issues. Uh, and this is called a moral acceptability study. And when it comes to animals and research, uh, the approval rate is 56%. In other words, 56% 50 of Americans who are polled view medical testing on animals to be a morally acceptable issue. That number is significantly down from years past. And I think we know many of the reasons why. Uh, there's another poll, um, and this is a, a more concerning poll that's regularly done by the Pew Research Center. And again, it's another one of those polls where they look at a variety of issues. And, this, and so it's a, a whole series of questions on a variety of topics. One of them is about scientific research. And in this case, uh, opposition is greater than um, those who are in favor. And so very concerning data. Uh, now, this poll did take place before uh, COVID-19, but um, based on the early results we see, I, we're, we're not certain that COVID-19 had a major impact on, on beliefs. There is some good news, though, in this in this Pew Center data, and that's the, um, they also looked at the trends and found that those with a lo higher level of scientific knowledge were uh, more inclined to support animal studies, uh, about 63%. 
Uh, and then also education levels had a, a significant component there. So I, you know, I think this definitely gives us uh, an additional roadmap and, and certainly um, agrees with much of what we heard in the previous presentation, which is the need, um, education has its benefits and it does ha actually have some returns. And so um, a lot of us need to get involved, including the scientific community. Um, one other piece of data before I move on to sort of communication advice and tips uh, and what we've learned in the past is the recognizing the role that scientists play in our uh, in our country, uh, in our society. And that's, um, you know, despite all of the controversies we faced over the last few years, uh, scientists have a, a very high level of respect and they are a trusted source. Uh, however, as, as if everything else uh, in this day and age, um, there, there is a political component there. Uh, those with more liberal leanings tend to trust scientists more, and those that are more conservative tend to less. In fact, uh, the military is another party that was often um, asked about. And as you can see there, the same goes as the military, uh, the trust in the military actually um, leans uh, to the to the right, where the trust of the military tends to uh, taper off when you ask those who are on the left. So um, that being said, despite all the, the leanings there, scientists remain a leading voice and a critical voice. And as we all know, um, they the, um, the scientific um, comments about COVID um, did move a lot of people to take action and get vaccinated and wear masks, et cetera. Not the entire population, as we know, but they did play a role in that. Um, so uh, we've already talked about why, you know, public opinion, uh, and that's a, a major concern for us. We've talked about the trust of scientists. We should also uh, recognize the fact that there are groups that have, are having an increased influence on legislation. Uh, and a couple examples of that, a couple of years ago in the state of Wisconsin, a community, a very small community called Spring Green actually voted to ban the breeding of dogs and cats for research. And that's because a nearby facility uh, opened up. It was a, a family owned facility that was owned by a local veterinarian. And interestingly enough, this, this law that was passed um, doesn't really have any effect because it happened to be adjacent to where this facility sits. That being said, it's pretty concerning that there are, uh, there are numerous attempts now in that state, including an, another a big attempt in the um, city of Madison where the University of Wisconsin resides uh, activists there are trying to ban breeding of animals there as well. And so we're our fear as an advocacy organization is that one day we have may have this map of the United States with red dots all over it where you cannot breed animals or maybe even conduct research in animals. And that's a very concerning thing. Uh, another group that uh, there's a, a group called Stop uh, White Coat Waste Project, which frequently uh, proposes legislation uh, that favors um, the end to animal research. Uh, a lot of times they will have um, uh, unfunded mandates in their research, meaning that they'll seek to um, create requirements that are unfunded. Uh, and so institutions, if those were, were to pass, institutions would you know, be searching for money to pay for the things that are now required. Uh, so that's a concern that we see. Uh, and, and a third reason why uh, we believe scientists and research organizations to communicate more about uh, animal research is the fact that currently opponents have become a, a primary a voice in defining what animal research is, its promise. Um, you know, here's a stat that we see all the time, and it's, it's a stat that's promoted by PETA claiming that 95% of all drugs shown to be safe and effective in animal tests fail in humans. And if you ever look at the source of that claim, it actually is an NIH webpage. And no, the NIH webpage does not say that. What the web webpage for the NIH says is that 5% of medications that go through this entire process are approved. And if, as we all know, that, that the process for biomedical research includes things like tissue samples, computer, um, computer tests, uh, uh, human studies, animal studies, uh, a wide variety of um, of methodologies. And so this, this PETA percentage is actually a faulty percentage because it doesn't recognize that the process weeds out uh, um, medications and other therapies. Um, that process involves much more than animals. You can't, you can't tie that percentage to animals specifically. 
But concerning enough that that percentage is starting to show up in, in official places, like in communications from Congress, where here's a letter that was sent by several uh, legislators to the interim NIH director. And as you can see, it, it literally quotes that PETA statistic as part of the letter. And here's the signatures. Yes, that's a small group of legislators, but the fact that now we now have DC legislators using faulty statistics that were created by animal rights groups, that's a concerning thing to us. And that's why we think that more organizations need to speak out. Um, so when it comes to communications, I think it can be confusing. What are we talking about? Are we talking about going out and doing media interviews? Are we talking about lectures, school talks, lab talks, public talks, talking with friends and neighbors? And my answer is all of the above. All of these are incredibly important. And in fact, some of the most important communications are those one-on-one, -on -one, you know, sitting at a dinner table with your neighbors, uh, having a community, you know, talk with your, your uncle. All of those kinds of communications are incredibly fruitful because it's a Q&A and it's interactive and it's a trusted source that's giving the information. So, uh, you know, even if a scientist only feels comfortable in talking with those that they know uh, more regularly, that's incredibly beneficial. And so the advice that we're giving that, that are coming in, that's coming in the future slides, please don't assume that we're only talking about media interviews or we're only talking about press releases or public talks. This is really, um, advice for communicating about animals and research. So here comes um, the poll question uh, from, from the communications arm. Uh, and I'll read this aloud. In regard to public communication and education about the need for animal studies, have you done any of the following? So we ask that audience members click, uh, click one of the boxes, or if you've done several, there's a box for several of the above or none of the above. And please don't um, feel guilty if the answer is none of the above, you're not the only one. So we'll, we'll give you a couple, uh, a few seconds to respond to that and we'll see what our results look like. Okay, and poll results. So spoken to friends or family is our, our well, no, actually several of the above is our, uh, our, winning, <laughs> our winning choice, which is great. Uh, it looks like the other, the, of the specific Choices, spoken with friends and family, another, again, a very successful strategy, given public talks, school talks, excellent. Uh, media interviews are less common, so of course that's a lower number, but uh, good to see that. And, you know, uh, we understand that, that there are some folks who have never had the opportunity or have had some concerns about communicating with the public. So let's talk about that. So often when I'm giving media relations um, training, so media training to talk to reporters. I'll often tell people that uh, many of the lessons learned in a media training session can also be applied to one-on-one -on -one communications, uh, presentations, et cetera. And we often tell people to consider using the inverted period. And if anybody here has taken a journalism course, they know what the inverted pyramid is. It's basically the way that a news story is formatted. So if you, you, know, you look at any news story, the headline attempts to capture that, the essence of that news story. The first paragraph sort of summarizes the full story, gives you a, a general understanding of what you're about to read. And then as you read down, it gets more and more detailed. And the, the way that news stories are, the reason why news stories are formatted in this way is because newspaper uh, editors know that people tend to, to read portions of articles, but they don't read the whole thing. And they, of course, begin written from the beginning. So um, that's a good way of delivering information is that, you know, provide a wide overview, get more specific, more specific, more specific. And that's, the, that's what we advise to people when communicating about this subject. In other words, you might, somebody might ask you what you do for a living, and you might give them a, a couple of sentences of a summary and then see what they ask next instead of, you know, talking for 10 minutes straight. And that's a good strategy to have. So um, with that in mind, with the inverted pyramid delivery in mind, uh, you know, some things to think about. Number one is consider your audience. Every audience is different. Uh, you know, of course, when you're talking uh, to the news media, you've got an incredibly broad audience of a variety of ages with a variety of levels of scientific knowledge. So you have to, you know, you do have to basically speak to uh, that, that basic level of science knowledge. When you're talking to a school group, if it's high school students, uh, you may feel more comfortable um, giving a little more scientific there. If it's sixth graders, it's a different story. So think about your audience. How much information can they can they take? Uh, what will they understand? What will register with them? Which which will keep them engaged? You know, if you come in and you give them a bunch of now, if you give a bunch of sixth graders a bunch of uh, a, um, 
uh, you know, figures and diagrams and, you know, titles of papers, they're likely not going to stay tuned. Um, so what I often used to tell people is that the job of a communications office at a university is to translate science. That's, that's actually true for a lot of folks who work in biomedical research, whether you're, if you're a scientist, if you're, if you're just simply an employee, sometimes you need to translate what's going on in the labs at your institution. And that's the fun part is, you know, I've got this incredibly um, complex mouse study that's looking at one particular gene. How do I make people understand that and actually appreciate it? And that's, that's really to tr the trick to all this. So I always say, start with the question, which is what's, what's the question you're trying to answer? You know, my lab is seeking to understand why some people are able to eat these high calorie diets and not gain weight and other people, um, you know, they, they, they have fight obesity their entire lives. Why, why is that? What's the generic genetic variability that causes that? You know, that's, that's a really interesting way to begin a discussion. And of course, um, we love stories. All of us love stories. I mean, uh, you know, we, we all have sat down and watched a show on Netflix, and then we watch the next one, and the next, and then the next one, because we love the story. We're pulled into it. We remember those stories. So, tell stories when you can. Explain, you know, if if there's a personal reason why you got involved in a line of research, explain that. Uh, you know, one story, here's an example of a story that I always remember is one of the very first uh, press releases I wrote when I when I switched from being a news reporter to being a science reporter, or I should say a science writer, was um, about some obesity research in mice. And I remember the scientist telling me at that time, his name was Roger Cohn, he's the, the, the senior author on this paper up in front of you. And he told me about studies where they were noticing that um, a gene, or I should say, I think it's a protein that has to do with coat color also seemed to be affiliated with that animal's um, weight and how much weight they gained over time. And you know, so they were they were breeding these fat mice and learning so much about um, how the the brain sort of um, uh, controls weight, uh, and they called that that um, that mechanism the adip adipostat. And I was fascinated by that story about you know the coat color and and animals, and I just that was that sticks with me to this day, and that was approximately 25 years ago when he first told me that story. So um, remember the the power of stories. Uh, I like to provide examples, uh, always incredibly helpful. We had some great examples in that first presentation that I really loved. Uh, certainly COVID-19 is a great example. I always talk about the mRNA vaccines um, that, that can be traced back to rodent studies that occurred in the, in the 1990s. Uh, I love to connect studies to humans and animals when possible. Of course, some basic science research, it's very difficult to, to connect that. And it's, we're not asking people to uh, make connections where they, they don't exist. Uh, but it's always helpful to define who might benefit in what way. Um, and in doing so, again, Jackson Laboratory does a great job of, of recognizing the need to demonstrate empathy. It, it certainly may exist, but you need to communicate that. Well, I mean, sorry, it, it certainly does exist, but it also needs to be communicated. Um, we need to explain to people. Um, we, don't, we shouldn't take for granted the fact that they assume we care for our animals and that we very much um, you know, um, check on them every day, et cetera. We need to communicate that. Uh, and then when possible, show images. Uh, we have a website called Come See Our World that's run by American Medical Progress. And the very purpose of that website is to demonstrate what animal research actually looks like and what animal facilities actually look like. And so you see uh, animals that live at a primate center or, or, or rabbits that live in a lab at a university. And you get a better understanding of what that actually looks like because the public, the, the, the images that the public often sees are promoted by those who are opposed, sometimes 30 or 40 year old um, images. So some do's and don'ts, these are very general, but some do's and don'ts for communicating with the public in, in multiple venues. Those anecdotes and stories are, are great things to share. Um, I've talked to scientists where you can recognize their enthusiasm right off the bat. They, they you know, their, their face gets red, they smile as they talk about their research. If you have that enthusiasm for your research, share it. Um, it's really important. People need to understand um, what we value and what we care about. Uh, be very open to questions, which is a good reason to use that, that inverted pyramid approach and leave time for questions in between. Uh, things that don't you shouldn't do is, is, is avoid jargon. You know, don't use jargon whenever you can. Uh, we fall into that trap all the time in academia. Uh, the le don't let, let negative questions um, shake you. And one tip I, I learned was I used to do, um, I used to have a booth 
at a regular science fair for our primate center. And what I learned was the toughest questions always came from like, high, uh, I should say like elementary school kids. They would come up and ask the toughest questions. And after a day of doing that, where it was like, oh my gosh, all of these really difficult, scary questions, then you start to become used to it. And you're like, wow, if, you know, and what I tell people is if you can answer the questions that are posed by, let's say a sixth grader, you can answer any question and feel comfortable. So that's a good way to, to sort of practice. Uh, and then, of course, listen to the cues or, or look for facial recognition in a face-to-face -face, um, discussion. You know, are they, are they picking up on this? Are they frowning? Is they, are they concerned? You know, you might ask a probing question about, you know, you have questions about that. So it looks like you're concerned. What, um, what do you want to ask about that? Anything is fine. Uh, be open to any question that comes up. Uh, tips for me being compelling. I'm going to, uh, this is actually a slide that I, I, I received um, or I saw a copy of from my friend, uh, Ken Gordon up at the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research. So I have taken, crafted this slide uh, slightly uh, myself, but uh, I think it's some great advice. Uh, be human, uh, use short and concise sentences when communicating, incredibly important. Don't talk to somebody for 10 minutes straight without a break. Uh, use those emotional links, use your, um, your enthusiasm, make con eye contact and smile, you know, don't, don't be defensive, uh, share your energy for your research. Um, I would say be careful with humor, especially when you're talking with animals. It's, it's, if you're a natural comedian, uh, and if you, uh, have funny stories to tell, that's great, but just, I always get very nervous when, um, animal research is a, is a line used in humor. I'd be very careful there. Uh, always be kind. Don't be defensive. Um, I prefer not to throw others in the science community under the bus. I um, occasionally you'll see uh, tends to be private companies will sort of be promoting what they're working on and then sort of, you know, in a way, throw scientists under the bus. I never think that's a very good idea. Uh, and then once you said your thing, your, your major point, listen and hear what the folks have to say. Um, when, when we provided media training, I'd always tell people, don't be afraid to put a period at the end of the sentence. If you've said what you need to say, stop saying it. Uh, and then if it's, if the person wants to argue, it's, there's no point to continue. Uh, you know, there, there, we all know that there are folks who have made their minds up on a variety of issues and it's really not worth the time or the pain to argue with somebody who is, is cemented in their positions. Uh, I'm about to wrap things up just to let you know where we stand. Um, a couple things about answering questions, because I know that's a big fear to folks. It's not so much talking about what you do, but what's the question I'll get asked when I say, I work at X lab and we study mice for X reason. Uh, be comfortable in answering those questions. And, and again, one good way is, you know, practice. Uh, do, some, do some talks before students. Uh, have your kids ask you questions. Maybe booth, uh, you know, man a booth at a science fair. Uh, recognize you don't have all the answers. It's totally fine to say, you know, I don't have an answer. I don't know that. That's not my expertise. Great question. We should look that up. Uh, and then point to reliable sources as needed, especially in those cases where you may not have the answer. Um, you might say, hey, you know, that's a good, good question. You could look that up. Uh, you know, the NIH database, if you want to look, look into studies, that's one place you could look that up. You could look at published studies, you know, give those resources out. Because one thing that, that we need to do is also point to the transparency about research is that there are a tremendous number of resources out there where people can learn more. And unfortunately, they're told by, by opponents that all this information is hidden. So it's also helpful to say, here's a good resource for you if you want to learn more, because all of this information is publicly available. Uh, and then of course, remember that questions are a good signal. They give you insight into what that person's thinking. So if, if they're asking you tough questions at the beginning of the interview, and then sort of, uh, easier questions at the end, that may mean you've actually, you know, tripped across something there and, and you've kind of taken, taken away some of their concerns. That's a good thing. Uh, uh, just a quick note before I wrap things up, uh, for those who aren't familiar with Americans for Medical Progress, we run a number of outreach pro uh, pro uh, programs, including Biomedical Research Awareness Day and Come See Our World. Uh, there's a few listed there. I'm not going to list them all, but we have lots of resources that are available there. Uh, and also the communication side of our, uh, our shop, uh, we provide communications assistance and advice. We help people with statements. We help with crisis issues. We create videos. We actually watch out for security challenges. Some of you may have received emails from us uh, warning you of things that might be uh, coming down the road. Uh, and we also have, of course, a lot of COVID-19 resources. So we're more than happy to assist. And just uh, if you want to reach us, the, the email address at the top of this slide is where you can find us and we're happy to help. Uh, and with that, I, I think I'm done. Okay. 
thanks very much, Jim, uh, for that really wonderful presentation to give us all an idea how to interact with the community. I would uh, say a couple of things. I'd like all of the speakers to, um, if, you've, if you have time when you've given your presentation, to look through the chat. We have some interesting questions that are beginning to come in. And uh, Jim, in particular, your comment about the drug failure rate has raised a bit of a firestorm out there. So, um, so I'd like to address that in the in the discussion afterwards. What is the real failure rate for drugs? And there's been also some questions about a beagle breeding site uh, from Envigo, um, and that if we can't control ourselves, um, what does that mean? Um, should we look after ourselves first and? Otherwise, the public won't have any confidence in us. So if you look through the chat, you'll see some some interesting uh, comments and, and questions that, that we'll get to later on. Excellent. So, yeah. OK, thanks. So thanks, Jim. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Erin Dixon. Uh, she's a postdoctoral uh, scholar at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Is it St. Louis or St. Louis? I don't I never know. I'm, I'm from England. What do I know? Um, so her research focuses on the transition from acute kidney injury to chronic kidney disease, and uh, importantly, uh, Dr. Dixon has served for three years on the APS, the Animal, the uh, um, American Physiological Society Animal Care and Experimentation Committee. This is a, um, one of the foremost venues in the APS where we talk about animal issues and animal welfare issues. She has taken on the role of advocate for biomedical research and um, has actually been uh, to Capitol Hill arguing on our um, on our behalf. So, um, Aaron, welcome and thank you for doing this. And we look forward to your presentation and hearing what you've got to say. So, go ahead. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you very much. Um, being from West Virginia, I do pronounce it St. Louis, but we'll leave it up for the locals to correct me on that one. Okay. So, uh, thank you all so much for staying tuned in to my section of our uh, session today on animal advocacy. Um, my job is to kind of open the discussion and really present a call to action for scientists and legislative advocacy, specifically surrounding these issues of animal research. Um, I didn't start out as someone with such a strong voice about these topics, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you all today about where I started and where I'm headed now. But um, before we start, we have a quick poll for you to kind of gauge your all's experience with uh, scientific advocacy. Uh, so that it just popped up on the screen. So if you haven't previously participated in animal research advocacy, why not? If you could answer that, that would help us, you know, kind of structure the talk for you. All right, great. Okay, so the majority of our answers were, I don't know how to properly advocate for these issues, and I'm hoping this talk is for you. Please feel free to chat um, some questions for me, and you know we'll have a larger discussion at the end. So, um, like I said, I want to start by sharing where I came from and why I came from maybe a unconfrontational place, and now I'm kind of out front and center talking about animal research. I also would like to address today why we still need to talk about animal research. I think this is something as scientists that we can forget in our day-to-day -day experiences behind the bench. Um, I would also like to add on to that why we should, as scientists, be taking up space in the realm of legislative advocacy. And also, finally, how to prepare to talk to staffers and the general public about these issues. So I started out, like I said, um, in a small liberal arts college in Virginia where I was a teaching assistant for a uh, animal model handling course. And this course taught best practices for using animals in research. But even with this early exposure to animal research in my training, I was very nervous to talk about it with family and friends. I always avoided it. I used very abstract language. But then I started graduate school at the University of Maryland, where I was working on a polycystic kidney disease project and actually in a cellular or in vitro model system. But what I found was through interacting with the community of PKD patients, they were very eager for progress. They 
really were invested in understanding, you know, where the next therapeutic um, targets were coming from, how were we moving that along, what were the advancements in the field. And it was at this point, it occurred to me, you know, from experience and seeing this firsthand, that cell models are only part of the story. We really rely on these animal models to get and improve public health. And just a quick shout out for World Kidney Day today as well. Uh, so during my graduate studies, I also applied to the uh, American Physiological Society's ACE committee. So this committee advocates for uh, the preservation of animal research. And it was through this experience that I got to go to Capitol Hill. I got to have my first meeting with legislative staffers and actually see for the first time that our role as scientists extends beyond the lab. Yes, we're good at writing grants and manuscripts and doing experiments, but we actually are resources for the community to talk about these issues, to help them understand what and how we're doing to, again, advance um, knowledge that applies to human and animal physiology. So I've continued this track as I've transitioned into my postdoctoral fellowship, again, still working on kidney disease, but this time in a mouse model. And I continue to, again, work with both APS and FASEB in these matters of animal advocacy. So like I said, I think many of my colleagues would, you know, ask, why do we still have to talk about animal research? We use these models every day. We write grants about them. We write IACUC proposals. You know, we are kind of, I guess, um, numb, maybe, <laughs> to the basic questions that people have for us. And these questions include things like, why do scientists even do research on animals? This is something that, you know, as you prepare for your first staff meeting, you wanna look at the gap between the scientific community and the legislative or the general public. They don't always understand because of our lack of communication, why and how these models are used. So we need to point to resources that show that we use them to identify new targets for disease, but not only do these help human physiology, but they also help animal physiology and can come into play with treatments of our own pets. Are research animals treated well? I will admit, before I got involved in advocacy, this is the one, probably the topic I had the greatest misconception about because of how it's portrayed in the media. But what we, again, need to to start talking about more is how we maintain the well being of our animals that we have around the clock care by highly specialized veterinary and support staff. And that everything we do throughout the day with these animals is regulated from the experiments we propose to how we analyze how many mice or whatever model system you need that we implore. And also, we have to justify our model system. We don't um, get to do anything without showing all of the alternatives. Do drugs developed in animals work in humans? I know there's some discussion in the chat about this and many current therapeutics that we use today were dependent on animal research models. I, I think the hottest topic would be the COVID-19 vaccine. And as I think I saw someone mention in the chat as well, drugs don't always work, but that doesn't mean it doesn't contribute to progress. Seeing a drug that may not work helps us learn more about multiple organ communication different cell-to-cell -cell communication, changes in toxicity, um, metabolic profiles, et cetera. Everything is still a step forward in progress. And finally, I think this is probably the question we get the most, but is animal research still necessary? This is the one that um, I actually look forward to answering in these legislative staff meetings because it's all about our communication on these issues. We see in the media all these breakthroughs about cellular model systems. But what we don't get is the uh, conversation about how there's still limitations for these model systems. We're not quite there yet, but we're working hard every day to push them further and further. I always use the example of the kidney. You know, it has over 20 different cell, type, cell types, even more cell states, but even the best model systems can only replicate a fraction of those cells. And even still, animals are still going to be needed to, to validate any new model systems. As I have said, you know, we work every day to reduce the use of animal models in our research. We are trying to innovate new techniques, but we still need the respected opportunity of using in vivo model systems along the way. As you prepare for, you know, your first legislative staff meeting, please visit uh, FASEB.org where they have all of these great fact sheets that will help give you these talking points critical for your meetings. 
So I also wanted to show this uh, representative, but by no means exhaustive list of active legislation that may target or pose a threat to animal research as we know it in the lab. And um, the point of this is really to show you that there is <laughs> there are many different topics that we need to discuss as scientists and that we need to take the initiative to bring into our uh, local representatives. But even with that long list of legislation, what we see is kind of a common thread of issues. Again, a common thread or a gap really of understanding in how animal model systems work, why we use them in research and why they're necessary for our research. These issues that you'll see again in active legislation and the ones that we need to discuss are targeting of sensitive species. These include cats, dogs, non-human primates, you know, model systems where our hearts are attached, you know, where we, we really care and people are very passionate. But we, again, need to commu communicate with our representatives and with our community that we only use these model systems under very certain circumstances for certain questions where it is the best representation of physiology needed to perform the research or identify the new drug. The second is increasing reporting requirements. I think this was the most shocking when I first started my meetings um, or meeting with legislative staffers is that they know very little about how much uh, research and paperwork and proposals we have to go through before we can actually perform an animal experiment. You know, we have to demonstrate why we need that model system. We need to demonstrate that there are no alternatives and that we're only going to use a certain number for a certain purpose. Mandatory adoption is also a very hot topic in legislation that we need to uh, talk more about how the infrastructure affects our research institutions. And finally, again, non-animal alternatives. Um, people are very passionate about the implementation of computer, mathematical, cellular models for the drug discovery pipeline or for just mechanism of action pipeline in uh, biomedical research. But we're just not there yet. But we are working every day and it's nice to reassure our representatives and again, our family and community members that this is the case. I think this is probably uh, the most important slide <laughs> that we'll talk about today. So why should scientists be leading these conversations? We take up very little space when it comes to legislative advocacy. I think we are all you know, focused in the lab and doing experiments, pushing out results, writing manuscripts and grants. Um, and the fact is <laughs> that this isn't the only part of our job. Again, as I said earlier, part of our job is being a liaison for the community, a resource for our legislative representatives. But many of us will come back with, you know, I don't have time to do that. You know, and again, there's intense pressure, especially for young investigators in, in their career development with many uh, commitments to mentoring grants and manuscripts. So it may seem like we don't have time to do this. But if we don't create time, if we don't make efforts to have these conversations, we will lose the support that allows us to make progress. And in this time, especially, we, we can't afford that. And the second, I'm not qualified. I think this is something, especially for, again, young trainees. What we don't realize is that we have such a specialized perspective. You know, we see the scientific process being used every day firsthand in cellular models, in animal systems, how this research may move from basic to translational studies. And this unique perspective in whatever capacity it may be, you don't have to have written an IACUC or be a PI, just understanding this pipeline and seeing it firsthand gives us a, a voice and a platform to speak about these issues. So please remember that advocacy will lead to our continued research support and that we all have a unique perspective. So how can you get involved? Well, um, first of all, you can attend this session. So check, I already made progress towards that. Second is, you know, look into these scientific, uh, scientific um, research associations such as American Physiological Society, FASAB, AAAS. They often have groups dedicated to science policy and advocacy where you can get involved and they're always looking for more volunteers. University groups as well. Ask your lab neighbor, ask people who are working at the bench next to you. Have they talked about these issues? Would they like to start? Really, the, all this boils down to find an advocacy mentor. Look for someone who's done this before that you can learn from. 
next um, after you know you have your connections and you're starting to learn a little bit about the process request a meeting this has become easier than ever with virtual advocacy just jumping on a zoom or a, a video call to have these conversations with legislative representatives you can also host these officials in your lab let them see firsthand what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and why animal models are pertinent and critical for that process and finally um, which I think Jim mentioned earlier, but share your opinions. And this doesn't have to be in a formal legislative meeting. This can be through using social media. This can be having a conversation with family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, et cetera. We have more avenues than ever to communicate letters to the editor, blogs, tweets, anything. Just start talking about it because the more we talk about it, the more we'll be able to put together a collective that can continue these advocacy efforts. I do want to quickly mention both benefits and challenges of virtual advocacy as you prepare for your first meetings. So there are a lot of great things about jumping on a Zoom call. It reduces travel limitations. You don't have to travel to DC for a couple of days and take that time away from lab. It also can encourage new people to join you. Grab your student, grab your coworker to jump on this call with you and have this conversation. However, um, it also requires more preparedness on your part, you know, talking with your team about how you're going to approach different heated topics. Because remember, people are passionate about this issue on both sides and they want to be heard and they also want to learn. So it can be easier to dismiss controversy or hard topics when you don't have, you know, your resources in front of you, a prepared, um, prepared talking points, ways you will handle different situation. It all comes down to the preparation. So speaking of preparation, what are you gonna do in a staff meeting? Um, before I joined the ACE committee, I had no idea how this would go. I honestly didn't even really know that this was a thing that people had to do. But what is important to remember and maybe learn today is that your legislative, legislative representatives are there to listen to you about topics that you care about. And we're hoping after our talk today that animal research is one of them. So once you get into your meeting, introduce yourself as a constituent. Explain why you're there, and hopefully they'll be excited to listen to your spiel. Always thank them for supporting biomedical research. As we've heard in the few talks earlier today, this is shifting in, in the favor of research, you know, with everything that's happened in the past two years. Thank them for being there and being present and taking the time to talk to you. Explain your research. So, Again, as we talked about earlier, you don't have to use any fancy vernacular. Just explain in you know, a very common way what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why specifically you need animal models to get to the next level, to identify that new target, to understand that mechanism of a particular protein or genetic mutation. Always mention federal agencies that fund your laboratory. Show that this is you know, a priority for these grant funding mechanisms, that your work is important for, again, progressing both human and animal health and physiology understanding. And now a thing I think that we all need to mention because it's all affected us is how the pandemic has affected your career and your work. You know, what changes were needed to make sure that your animals were taken care of? How um, will you move forward with, you know, all the uh, troubles and barriers we've gone through the past couple of years to continue to perform high level and safe animal research. And finally, always end your meetings reminding your uh, legislative representatives that as much as they are there for you, you are there for them. We are a resource. We are a liaison and we really need to start acting on this facet of our occupation as scientists. So um, in conclusion, I just want to say that, you know, we all know every day that using animals in research is a highly respected opportunity. We all appreciate and um, honor this opportunity to use in vivo model systems to progress science. And we have to show that to our legislation and to our representatives and our community by protecting funding and access to these models. If you're looking for a place to get started, reach out to local or national or international chapters of your scientific research organizations or even your university. And 
remember, you don't have to get stuck in a, oh, I have to have a meeting with a staff or I have to start big. Advocacy comes in many forms. Just having a simple conversation gets you started in the right direction. Continuing to go to seminars like this continues the conversation in the right direction. And finally, if you take away nothing else from today, remember that our job is more than standing behind the bench, doing experiments, pushing out papers. We also are here to serve the community, to increase avenues uh, for public health and support uh, the learning and the knowledge that we can get from both human and animal physiological systems. Uh, before I wrap up completely, I would like to add one more poll um, addressing, you know, if you're ready to take on advocacy efforts now. So it just popped up. Can you see yourself taking actions to support science policies in the near future? Hopefully the majority will be, yes, I'm ready. But if it's not quite yet, again, we're here to further the conversation. Okay, I'm pretty happy to see that. 48%, uh, yes, I'm ready, and we will help you uh, create a, uh, do some research and create a plan. So um, with that, I would just like to end by, again, thanking the American Physiological Society for supporting me in this talk today, as well as the sponsors with Technoplast, Americans for Medical Progress, and the North American 3Rs Collaborative. A special thank you to the members of the ACE committee, especially Alyssa Hatfield and Rebecca Ostas. And if you have questions about the specific legislation that we discussed today or how to get involved, please shoot an email to sciencepolicy at physiology.org. We'll be happy to answer your questions. So thanks very much, Erin, for that really important talk with lots of practical information about how to, how to get involved. And speaking of practical information, I asked um, Alyssa Hatfield, who was one of our APS uh, members who, um, who actually helped to bring this webinar to fruition along with, uh, with Jake White. So Jake and Alyssa, thanks very much for, for, for helping with this, as well as Paula Clifford at, at, um, at AMP. So uh, if you look in the chat, you will see, please sign up for APS Action Alerts. This is a really, really easy way to start moving ahead with this advocacy because we actually um, tailor this to, to you. We, we tailor this and tell you who your representatives are, both in the Congress and in the House. And we make it very, very easy for you to send um, a, a response to particular legislative actions. So we pick the actions we'd like you to respond to, uh, we send it to you, and you can respond immediately. This is, it really just takes three or four minutes to do this. So for the 47% who said they wanted to get involved and they're ready, uh, this is probably one of the first steps that you can take to actually start um, responding to the sign up to this um, APS action alerts. Um, with that, I'd also like to thank uh, Stefano Gubara at Techniplast for also bringing this webinar to fruition and sponsoring this. And, um, as, as, and Stefan is um, the scientific director at Techniplast. He's a member of the North American 3 Rs Collaborative, and he uses his background in preclinical uh, research to help researchers refine their approaches to improve methodologies, to improve um, lab products. And so it's a real pleasure to have uh, you representing Techniplast and the animal research community here today. So thanks, um, Dr. Gabaru. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown, for the nice introduction. Me also as a member of the North American Trial Collaborative. And today I would like to talk about uh, the animal research and perspective also from Europe. And that's what actually pushed me to reach out to the APS and others, and also <clears throat> put in perspective with North American activities in terms of animal model refinement and also alternatives. So I would like just to start with this quote in that laboratory animals do not read our papers. In other words, basically sometimes the hypotheses that we ask are not met. But I can for sure tell you, and this goes to my next slides about the acknowledgement that we all believe, all companies, all of these companies, that if we, we do care about responsible use of the animals and also on the welfare and the refinement of the models, that you will get the response you look for if you have the right biological question. As scientists, though, um, I, 
we have, you know, we heard before, we have sometimes hard time to come out of the lab and then go and reach out to others. So I would like just to provide a few examples of what is happening in Europe and US. Speak of direct research, there was an example given by Dr. Liu before. And then um, also speaking of, uh, speaking of direct example from the North American Tria Collaborative in terms of refinement and replacement. In science, by education, we are very good at doing this process. We all know, we learn from the very first year of biology, medicine, so research, we have our hypothesis, we go into results and we go into dissemination, which is publication, which is presentation, which eventually lead then to grant approval and back to research. When we have animals, however, we have also to write our animal license, which goes to IACUC and in Europe, we have also to write a non-technical summary, which is basically a lay uh, summary for the people, if they want. And it's uh, in place in Europe since 2021, so it's mandatory. It is in the language in the country that you write it, like in Germany, where I am, you write it in German, in Italian. And people can access, uh, normal people can access those um, those documentation through a database. But if I were to ask my mother or my son do you know about this uh, website? They will, the answer will be no. So there is much more to do from our side as scientists to be able to reach out to people and explain why we do use animals for a specific purpose. So, and the, on the other side, there was many questions about, you know, activist associations speak directly to the public. And these are just a few examples that were mentioned before, taken from the ERA uh, website. And, in which you know there are a few sentences that might correspond to to true or is a misinterpretation to what basically as we learned before from jim uh, about what was written from the nih in the us uh, we just also learned that is the white coast uh, waste is the uh, website and is it really important to us and it is the case i think there was this example which wasn't mentioned before i don't know if you heard but basically the uh, University of Washington, the IACUC members, uh, basically to uh, set up a lawsuit against the University of Washington to seek protection. Basically, their names were, were published and then they found activists in front of their houses. This is something we want to avoid because we need to work all together. In Europe, uh, similarly, uh, there were two, I don't know if you heard in the US, but there were two uh, very important votes that took place. One was at the Swiss level, so basically Switzerland vote for a referendum in which they wanted to ban all animal research. And that would have implied that all the product that come, have come from animal research would have been stopped to be used from that time if they would have voted for yes. On the right side, though, the member of the European Parliament uh, demanded uh, the European Commission to think or oh, they voted uh, uh, pro accelerating the phasing out of animal research. Fortunately, uh, both the referendum, so the people uh, voted against uh, uh, the referendum and the response from the commission was basically there is no foreseeable change because of the limitation or some limitation to alternatives that the, um, the animal research will be phasing out. So now my question to you is, as a poll, and do you think that phasing out of animals research is a justified worry? Okay, well, that seems to be very much in line to what we basically saw before, though almost 25% think maybe becoming problematic. Um, I borrowed this picture from a conference and basically, um, and uh, I took it from the presentation from Kirklish from the Yara. And basically this really depict uh, some scientists presenting their proud work with animals but basically you see that their faces are pixeled and um, because they wanted to avoid potentially to be you know, tackled, to be exposed because there were also people from the um, media there. And I think we should actually go out and talk more about animal research in the modality that has been uh, presented before. 
it's very easy to speak about direct application of animal research if you mention these two examples. On the left side, there were some studies uh, performed in uh, rats and uh, no human primates. And basically, the scientists uh, in uh, Luzon developed a patch that goes in the spinal cord. And with the application of this patch, uh, this human Italian paralyzed, so it was fully paralyzed, could walk again. And we learned already before uh, from the um, from the transplantation from transgenic pigs into humans. Unfortunately, the patient has died. But these are direct application, and this will actually tell I do research which is actually sensational and it's a really direct application. If you do basic research or other type of research, actually a good idea how to reach out to other group is to join the group like the North American Trial Collaborative or other groups in which we basically look at the highest standard for refinement, reduction and replacement in animal models. One of the group that I'm part of is called the Translational Digital Biomarker. And basically this group is looking for refinement of animal experiment and doing experiment in the stress-free condition, especially in uh, uh, models like um, mice and rats within the home cage. And actually a landmark paper was just published uh, 2022 in which we look for, uh, or we give an overview of digital biomarkers, which are um, gained within, uh, within the home cage and used basically for, for drug discovery and uh, development. And one of the example coming back from uh, what uh, Dr. Yu was saying before that they, at the Jackson they humanize animals is this example actually from a COVID model. And uh, this mouse model is called the, is a transgenic mouse model called the K18HAC2 uh, transgenic mouse. Basically it uh, bears or harbor uh, the um, humanized um, SC2 receptor because the spike 2 originally uh, could not bind to the mice, but they, they were used also in other models and because the mice are so good and you can have many of those. Um, by the time they were created for the SARS, uh, the SARS was basically gone. They were cryopreserved preserved at Jackson's lab. And then they were basically uh, revamped by the time that uh, I think it was started in uh, January, February, uh, 2020, and now they are currently studied for many, many also vaccine uh, development. What you have to know, though, is that when you do a SARS-CoV-2 type of research, uh, mostly, and also the infection type of study, the typical output that you take out as a welfare uh, of the animal is the body weight, daily body weight. And it is a first publication that came out uh, in August 2020, the researchers basically uh, at day zero uh, injected the animals uh, shown in blue with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then they had also the MOX or the control group. And you see that basically the body weight uh, start to change only at day five significantly. And day seven, the animals has to be sacrificed because they are very, very sick. However, if you look at humans, um, and I had also COVID, uh, the first thing that you will look for symptoms is not the change in body weight, but rather is fatigue and other symptoms that actually occur also for long COVID for many, many times. And now if we put that into context with animals, you would potentially look at locomotion if there is a way to measure it in the home cage monitoring these BSL-3 labs. And here, basically, a system for home cage monitoring was used. On the left side, the body weight taken uh, normally, as you would do you know, in, uh, in the previous study. On the right side, you have the distance travel change as a percentage. On day zero, you have the inoculation day. And also here, you see that the body weight start to change at day four and significantly at day five. But by the time on the right side, when the body weight start to change, there is already inactivity by 90%, indicating sickness of the animal. Potentially, the animals are already so sick from day one that they don't move much and then they don't go to eat and at day four they start to lose uh, weight or they go into torpor. I mean, there are many, many things that could actually happen there. But using other markers within arm cage, you can actually better resemble the human situation. I told you that locomotion can be used or used in other studies. Another model used for COVID was the hamsters or were the hamsters uh, heavily. In this example, um, the control animals were not uh, treated, 
but then uh, there were also vaccines that were under testing and they didn't work in this case because you see that the locomotion uh, irrespective of the vaccine given didn't actually came back. But this is another example in which basically home cage monitoring were used for uh, testing also other species other than uh, uh, mouse models. In terms of uh, replacement and reduction, there, is other, there are other initiatives within the uh, North American Triacol Laboratory, like the Macrophysiological System Initiative, that basically look at a miniaturized system that mimic the physiology of tissues, organs, or systems for function, cellular metabolism, and cellular dynamics. And the, 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 I think the principle of this is that it contains the major organ-specific cell types arranged as in humans to allow for cell-cell interaction. And many things can be studied. For instance, you can study astrocytes and the you know, 3D reconstruction of neurons. You can also look at functional liver or look at microtumors in the perfused, perfused breast. And then you can look, for instance, at toxicity of different drugs, like on the left side, um, ketorolac trothamine was uh, given. And if you look at viability of a concentration, you will see that in this case, for 72 hours, there was no effect on the cells. Whereas on the right side, if you give toxorubicin, which is a cytotoxic effect, it has a very strong uh, effect at the very, uh, there is a negative correlation between the viability and the concentration. You can potentially look also at the functional efficacy. For instance, in this case, you can look on the left side at the neurite um, elongation between control and, tr and treated uh, cells. And on the right side, you can look at the electrophysiological properties. And with that, actually, you can reduce the number of animals because let's say that you have a compound that is 100% is functionally working, but then the functional toxicity, structural toxicity and viability also look, they, you know, they give uh, a positive result, meaning they are toxic. You would exclude this compound. And let's say that you set your uh, functional ratio to be the minimum 70%, you can also rescue the others and only test, uh, sorry, uh, remove the others and only test two compounds over the uh, foreseen um, rodent and also no rodent um, animal studies that you will have to do. In other words, instead of having seven times uh, the compounds, you will reduce the number of animals dramatically. And the conception is actually to have integrative toxicology approach in which you can, on the one side, use first NPS system or other system that would re reduce the number of animals. And on the other side, use a better refined models in no stress uh, environment to better mimic the uh, symptoms. And with that, I come to my second acknowledgement point. I would like really to thank again, uh, Alisa, Rebecca and Jake from America Physiological Society to helping me set it up. Paula, also from the AMP and uh, from the North American Triac Collaborative, uh, Megan and Cliff. And with that, I would like to thank you for the attention. Thanks very much, Stefano. That was really uh, extremely interesting and a nice presentation about what, you, uh, what you're doing with your organization. And at this point uh, in the proceedings, I'd like to invite all of the panelists to turn on their cameras. I'll start to go through some of the questions. Um, and I'd just like to remind the audience that please put your questions in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can. And so we'll start off with uh, with a couple of things and, and, and feel free all of the panelists to, to, to step in here, but maybe I'll direct one or two of the questions specifically to, uh, to particular panelists. So Ed, um, you're at the Jackson Labs in a relatively closed kind of island community right up in um, up in Maine, but but with further expansion um, internationally known. But locally, locally, how, how do you, you you talked about how you interact with with um, with your staff to talk about animal research and their feelings. But what kind of steps do you take with the local community to um, to uh, to talk to them about what goes on in this massive building, which is probably the biggest employer in the in the region, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. So um, in all truth, we, we are in um, three states um, with six different sites in US okay. and one in Japan and one in China. So we're really, our yeah. footprint oh. is, is yeah. rather broad. Um, but the, the first thing is to really understand the, the core of potential opposition. The first thing is that um, we really do want to impress people we're good neighbors. That's the first and foremost. The second is that we're responsible scientists. And the third is that our science makes a difference. Those are key, without which no matter what defense you have will never work. Um, the second uh, issue around that is to make sure we have um, reasonable allies like this family we're talking about. And then the, you multiply that by several hundred and we have a cadre of really devoted um, um, lay public who will speak on our behalf um, uh, to do so. The third thing, um, and so, you know, th that in and of itself is not a trivial task. That requires a tremendous amount of work and outreach. And once we have established that, then everybody knows the Jackson Labs is about mice. I, I don't have to say anything else. And so that will carry the message, I think, in a very significant way. Then of course, um, uh, if the conversation comes, uh, uh, comes up and occasionally it does, we make very sure that um, individuals know how serious we are. And this, this Our Mice, Our Hope really has turned out to be a fantastic, not only a, a true cultural um, tool, but also, dare I say, it's, a, it's, it's really good external because it says we really do care um, to go forward with that. Now, one thing I, I do want to uh, address, and we've tried this internally, and, uh, and I think it would be great if we could join forces, is the question that was asked, all this misinformation. Um, you know, we have to spend a lot of our own time and effort to dig up the sources of this mis misinformation. This is not central, and it's not about mice, it's about everything in general, like drug discovery. And so it would be great if we could join forces to attack the top 20 question, the 20, the 20 accusations that are there and really go deep into getting the true answers to this. Very importantly, we need to give that to our legislative um, um, you know, representatives, but equally we can actually answer them individually going forward. The only last thing is because we're such a um, major player in both Connecticut and in Maine, we have uh, spent a lot of time having good relationships with, uh, with our legislative uh, representatives. Uh, and I, I spent a lot of my time, much of my time, you know, fostering those relationships. So they, they see a human face behind the work that we do. Thanks. Jim, uh, particularly to you this one, but again, everybody else can, can answer. Um, there was a question in the chat earlier uh, earlier about the um, the lack of uh, USDA um, regulation following at uh, this uh, Cumberland facility in Virginia that that you that you obviously know about and I'm sure you've dealt with this. Um, but this is not the only one. And 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 what do you do when one of these things? Because it seems to me that one incident like this undoes 20 years of good work. So 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 how can we prevent this happening? And what do we do about it? How do we how do we kind of redress the balance that's that's lost with when these incidents do do because they always hit the front page well i think the first thing is recognizing that um events whether they're true or they're manufactured by animal activists events at one facility hurt all of us right uh, negative events uh in virginia uh hurt a facility in california because that builds public perception so i think that's number one is, re is recognition that whether you know the in the incidents are true or false that's the important thing. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as I used to work at a facility that was actually infiltrated twice. And in both cases, we were cleared by the USDA. But as I often said to people that specifically that first infiltration caused us about 10 years of grief because people believed you know, a lot of what they heard from the activist group. So number one, recognizing that the, these incidents have uh, damaging consequences. And then the uh, you know, next, after we recognize that, I think the next toll or the next task is uh, to recognize our points of weakness, whether it's hiring employees 
whether it's uh, you know building the need to build that um, that reputation. So I think that um, what Dr. Lou just said was really important is building that neighborhood reputation. So between the two um, infiltrations that we underwent in our facility in Oregon, uh, we actually did a tremendous amount of community work. And so when the infiltration came around the second time, many of our supporters said, well, that's that doesn't match what I saw when I took a tour of that place two weeks ago. And it was a very it was a much easier incident to deal with because people recognize what they heard in the news uh, didn't match what their own personal experiences was were. And so that was very that was very helpful. Uh, you know, so yeah. recognizing the the threats, um, we need to aggressively push back when when animal rights groups make claims about us. Whether they're true or there's only a, a sliver of truth, we need to fight back more aggressively. Um, Dennis, those are, those are a few thoughts. Can, can I extend uh, Jim's very, very smart remarks? And at one point, <clears throat> the culture, because of some of the events in the past, I'm talking about 20, 15 years ago, there was a tendency for the um, organization to hunker down, starting to close up, um, prevent, you know, not talk about um, the, the research that was done, not even try, trying not to even mention mice. Um, quite frankly, I reverse that because I think the worst thing we can do is to hide, I, I, honestly. And, um, and as long as exactly what Jim said, we do our jobs and do it well and do it humanely. Mm -hmm. uh, we do it intelligently and actually make sure that our work has impact it's something we need to talk about and show to our communities as opposed to trying to hide um, the fact that we're, do we're doing this kind of experimentation. Before we move on to questions for, for Aaron and, and, um, and Stefan, I, I would like to come back. I, I wouldn't like Noel to go home very disappointed. Um, so so uh, Jim, Noel puts in the chat a very disappointing response. Can you please comment regarding the USDA findings, which were egregious? Yeah. you know. Having worked at a facility that was infiltrated twice, I, I actually don't like attacking one another. Uh, I will agree that what we saw in Virginia, there was some very troubling imaging, very frustrating. They, um, I, I'm, I think they could have done much more to respond to that. Um, I, I will say as, an as a facility that's been infiltrated, there were things that were said about us and images that were shown that were completely bogus. There may be some of that in that facility. I, I don't want to throw that facility entirely under the bus. I will say the results of that are damaging for all of us. But, um, you know, I think we need to be careful here is not to um, just say that'll never happen to us. So therefore, they're they're awful. I, I would say yeah. go look at go look at an institution like my own where we were infiltrated twice and cleared twice, but still paid the price for it. And, and as you well know, Jim, at Harvard, we had a problem with our uh, primate colony as well, which was um, um, a problem. So, so Aaron, um, I'd, I'd like to come to you now. What, what, when you go to Capitol Hill, when you talk to, uh, you know, to all these other uh, higher ups and the staffers, um, I, I'd like to ask you two questions. First of all, what was, was there anything that was shocking to you that, that that you didn't appreciate before you stepped into the door or knocked on the door was there anything that um, that you didn't expect that, that took you by surprise that kind of threw you off balance about about their attitude um so that's number one and secondly um i, I wouldn't like all of the 150 people who are still on this call to 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 go away and to do nothing i'd like them to do something so the second thing is is if you could tell them just to do one thing what would that be before when when they leave and when they when they go home absolutely i really appreciate your question so as for the first one um this actually happened at my very first uh, legislative staffer meeting so i was a graduate student i was new on the ace committee at the time and the staffer uh, said to me well you must be here because you hate animals oh. and i was taken aback um because I am a huge animal lover and, you know, I grew up again, like I said, you know, a very rural community around horses, dogs, cats, everything. Um, I also have many pets and, you know, I think what this showed me is that sometimes um, because of perceptions with the media or how things are communicated that 
uh, people forget that scientists are humans too, that we, you know, show care and have care and that we respect the opportunity that we have to use these animal model systems and that we do everything in our power every day to make sure that they are taken care of and protected. Um, this really showed me, you know, the, the largest gap in communication from scientists to the public. Um, and, and just to also respond for people who may be starting to get interested in this, you know, my response to that was, you know, not to kind of shout back or dig my heels in, but just to come back and calmly explain, you know, my experiences growing up, where I'm coming from using animal models and why it's important. And every time that I've had this conversation, which it has been repeated in different iterations, you know, it always comes back with understanding, you know, people just want to have this conversation. So having it in a calm, collected and, you know, highly sourced way um, will help, you know, progress this further. And then if everyone here that attends the talk today, the very first action, especially if you're early in your career, um, I think you should do is reach out to your scientific organization of choice, whether this be APS or AAAS or FASEB. I think this is the greatest community that can help support advocacy, and they'll be here to, you know, you know, share resources, share mentors, and really help help you get started in this journey. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, so Stefano, now and then I'll ask one specific question to you, then we'll get to more panel discussions as well. So, um, you know, you've talked about the three R's um, and that's the, you know, your focus. So where do you see this shifting in the future? How, how do you see this? Because um, I, I'm, I, I would be concerned, we've talked about drugs, um, drugs that are tested in animals that are failing in humans. But there's also the concept, we, we did a study relatively recently where we tested 5,000 compounds in cell cultures and picked only five of them to test in, in subsequent studies. And I always worry that we missed 4,995 you know, uh, compounds, some of which could potentially be useful, but we didn't go that far. So, so how do you redress this balance that testing in, in other systems might actually miss something that's really critical that you could, that, that would only show up in animal models? Yeah, but then it might be specific to animal models. So, I mean, I think we should take care about the integrative approach uh, in terms of, you know, what you mentioned before, that it was one of my last slide in terms of uh, selecting the compound and eventually repurposing the drugs that are already there. Uh, because you know they might have common drug there was a, there is a big uh, center in uh, sorry center collaboration in europe try to repurpose basically drugs that are already on the market for other purposes because they target i don't know nk1 receptor uh, you name it on the one side what i see and uh, what uh, ed said before is that i mean the digital libraries might be re replacement and reduction of animal models if we find a way to metadata properly you know if i look for 57 is that J, is that N, what, wh where does it come from? You know, once we will start to basically track the animals from when they are win until basically the end, and we have all of this information in digital way, then we might be able basically to create the libraries that we, it was mentioned before, and then each researchers will not any longer need basically to run control animals. You might need one, two, three, four, or you know the specific model, and then looking uh, specifically at, at that. And I think, uh, but you know this this um, like the database that was created for the NTS. I think Europe, the the I don't know the FDA, the NIH should create you know this this consortium, this consensus of things before then jumping into digital libraries because you might call a C57. J, I might call it N, and if it is just C57, you don't know what you're looking at really at. Thank you. Um, so the, the other thing I, I would just like to, to, to bring up is that we've, most of the discussion when people are talking about failure has been about drugs, but that's not the only type of research that's done on animals because we have, um, we, we have procedures that are tested on animals, we have um, surgery we have prosthetics that are all tested on animals as well so that's it's not it's not only only drugs um there's a question in the chat about how we, we've talked about communicating with the public but any ideas from any of you now about how to communicate this to your colleagues maybe some of your colleagues who do not use animals who are you know mainly in vitro people or or or, or molecular biologists how do you how do you how do you go about communicating this and getting them involved and and um, and making them understand what you do. So any, I'm open to anybody here. Well, I can tell you that 
almost, well, most of my colleagues who do primarily in vitro work are fully cognizant of, of the necessity of animal work. Um, so uh, there are some outliers um, that I've encountered who really, um, you know, uh, get on a, 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 um, a narrative that really um, uh, starts to do, um, uh, undermine uh, any uh, animal research, particularly mouse research, you know, it's because of my role, like it's directed at me. But on the whole, um, those are individuals who are, are um, quite frankly, from the medical uh, community, not from the scientific community, okay, um, that really haven't done any scientific work. And then the second part of it are, are individuals who, um, uh, are really trying to argue the case for their model system, you know, to funding agencies. And it's very easy to, to uh, discredit, you know, some standard approaches and so forth. The only thing I, my response always is that, um, you know, these systems are not perfect. And my argument is quite frankly, in terms of some of the failures of using mites, um, we've actually looked at some of those so-called failures and um, it, I would say it's the uh, inappropriate use of the animal system. There's a, a commentary here in the, in the chat that was totally true that every model system, whether they're cellular or, or primate even, have, um, have significant shortcomings. And we need to, as scientists, not in any in, as individuals using animals, need to acknowledge those shortcomings. We have found that in terms of the mouse work, what has happened over 50 and 60 years is mouse uh, experimentation used to be done by a small group of people who were absolutely expert at mouse genetics. This is just the nature of the beast. Once it got much easier to use mice and to engineer it, then uh, a, a broader range of scientists were using it. And I would say these are scientists, and I would say, including me in my earlier phase of scientific discovery, really had no, no clue as to the nuances of this model system and the limitations of them. Yeah. So uh, that's part of the reason why we have such a strong uh, education system around mouse um, surgery, mouse experimentation, is to make sure our colleagues know the limitations, not just what can be done, but what are the limitations of the system. Absolutely. Anybody else have a, a, a comment uh, they'd like to make on this, Erin? Yeah, yeah, I would like to, to add, you know, this is a question that we often, you know, are asked in our legislative meetings as well, and that we also see, you know, within labs, and you could say even out of department in, in different areas of science. But I think the conversation we need to have, like um, Dr. Liu just mentioned, is that we, you know, these things are complementary model systems. Everything has shortcomings and they have to be used interchangeably with each other. Um, because, and I'll share kind of the pipeline really quickly for our laboratory. So we do a lot of transcriptomics on different animal systems and we do it on these animal systems so we can reduce the number of animals being used by other labs because they have access to our transcriptomic atlases. And then in turn, we can validate our findings from the transcriptomics in cellular models. So these all come into play because, you know, again, I always bring it back to the kidney because that's kind of my home, <laughs> hometown, okay. but, um, you know, the complexity of the kidney or any other tissue can't be replicated in cells, but we can ask specific questions in cells. And that's where the complement of in vivo and in vitro model systems really advance our progress. And I think to one of the um, attendees who commented, I mean, this conversation could be had with people in environmental sciences and other aspects as well. It's the complement of these model systems that will ultimately advance and produce new science. So, that, so, so there's a comment that I think uh, many of us wrestle with is um, re relaying the importance of studies that are not directly relevant to humans. So, you know, the, the, the need for fundamental research as, as well. So, Stefano, how do you deal with that in terms of communicating the, the importance of fundamental research, even if it's not obviously directly led, leading to a medical advance? 
Yes, I think uh, to understand the pathology, we always have to understand the physiology of things. And understanding physiology doesn't necessarily mean that you have to understand, you know, if a mouse has an heart rate increase to 780, doesn't necessarily mean that it will, you know, be replicated in humans, which has a, you know, heart rate at that uh, at stage at 60, potentially minus 70 right now. So, um, but you have to understand the basics uh, before then moving into, into complex uh, and that's how, you know, I explained also to my son, that was the, the point, uh, you know, what do, do I do? I said, first I look at the, if a mouse is, uh, is okay, and I look if he's getting sick. And yeah. then he understands that, and if I, understand, if I can transmit this information to, to him, I, I would, you know, and I can simply show the graphs. So you see the, the, the heart rate is going too much high, and it, it looks like this, and they said, oh, it's all over the place. And that's how I basically comment these things to, to lay people, also to my wife and to the families in a very, um, so you have to understand the, the physiology, like, you know, when we tested the COVID, uh, I showed before, we have to first see what, you know, control animals respond to, for instance, antibodies or to any treatment. And then we move into the specific mouse model. So sure. how old is your son, by the way? 11. Is 11. What? This is just a funny story. I know that uh, Jim said we're not supposed to use humor, but I'm going to risk that. Uh, I, I was asked to give a career talk um, at school when my son was, I think, six or seven years old. And um, then the, the kids had to introduce their dads. And my son, Chris, said, this is my dad. He kills rats. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was his introduction. So I said, OK, I've got to talk to my <laughs> uh, to my son, make sure that he kind of understands a little bit more about what I'm doing. Um, so, so he became a biologist now. So he's a he, he followed in his daddy's footsteps. Um, okay, I, I have a question here, more specifically, I guess for, for Jim. Um, how how can your group and and how can we help to protect the, the the scientists like the ones that we saw who were being aggressed by animal rights groups? What what is being done uh, to to protect um, to protect us, basically. Right. Well, number one, um, I would say to for scientists that are concerned, they should be work work closely with their communication staff. They should work closely with security staff. And if those folks aren't listening, get your department chairs involved. Move up the chain because sometimes it's hard to get their attention. I'll I'll say that from a communications perspective. Also, there's a common misconception that speaking out about research makes you a target. And I have many times shared some examples as when I worked in a uh, uh, university setting, uh, the scientist that I worked with most was a primate scientist, and we he had several internationally recognized, I mean, stories that generated international attention um, that also, of course, generated lots of local attention. Another scientist I regularly work with was a primate scientist who, who um, was conducting AIDS uh, vaccine research, and those two scientists were never targeted, and despite the fact that they were the two primary voices at our institution. And we recognize that's because the activists realized that the, the public wouldn't re respond well if they were attacking these two scientists who got had this world-renowned um, experience, you know, this world-renowned um, uh, research. And so uh, speaking about research in a safe way, you know, I certainly am not suggesting you go out on the street corner and start promoting uh, animal studies, but you need to do it in a very strategic and, and thoughtful way. That doesn't mean you're going to be a target. Um, that being said, make sure it's on the radar of the security staff when you're going to give a talk. If, if you get strange emails, alert people right away. Um, they're often warning signs if you're going to be the target of a campaign. Uh, and, and there are folks who can manage, help you manage those things pretty well. Um, you know, they can't make it all go away entirely, but they can definitely give you some tools to work with. Stefano, do you, do, you, do, you, do you see any difference between the way that this happens in Europe and in, in, in the USA in terms um, of targeting of researchers? Uh, no, in that um, uh, there are also private centers that have been closed, have been attacked in the UK, in the Netherlands. Um, COVID actually silenced uh, most of the activists in Europe because they, they understood really that without animals, we would not have developed safe and efficient vaccine that yeah. have worked for, you know, 7 billion people. So it's not very different, I think, across uh, the, the country. I mean, we, like the Washington state I mentioned before, we have also activists in front of the people. We, there have been, you know, centers that have been closed, videos and everything else. Uh, but um, all in all, uh, I think it's up to us to really communicate openly about what we do 
uh, not of course going on the street, but I mean, uh, strategically at conferences and everything. And I think, uh, um, I mean, I, I'll throw it there, but I mean, uh, if there was a petition everywhere globally to see, you know, would it be pro animal research and responsible use for it? And then, but then you have to advocate for it. Would you do it? Uh, I think it would be something that someone should start at some point. Sure. So we're coming to the close now, and I know that uh, we have um, a little survey about the session to, 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 that we'd like the audience um, to, to fill in before we finish. So I'll give you all about uh, 30 seconds to give some final thoughts um, about um, how we should go about um, advertising and, and promoting what we do. And um, so, so Ed, you would like to start just 30 seconds, just find a final cogent thought. Or, or not cogent, whatever. <laughs> uh, hopefully cogent. Um, um, you know, what I'd like to do is to um, take advantage of this meeting and then further join forces with you all. Um, and very importantly for me is to really craft the appropriate narrative together, including direct answers to this misinformation, which I have told you, we spend so much time trying to chase these downs um, that it's 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 not it's not productive for us. So if we can can um, uh, work together on appropriate narrative, just as much as the animal activists have done, really, quite frankly, uh, and do it in a responsible way, I think it will help everybody. Great, thank you, Jim. No, I, I would add to that. I think that there are some several questions that have been posed by some claims that have been made. And I, I, the one that really bothers me is that 95% claim that there's been so much discussion about because it's, it's sort of picked it's up and there. carried a life of its own and it's becoming a problem for us in many venues. So I, I think that um, working collaboratively, we've done some work on that before, but we certainly want to work with others. Uh, in in this, this discussion alone, um, some, some folks offered some, some great input as to things that could be said to respond to that claim. So I think that discussions like this can hopefully um, lead to collaboration and creation of messages that are centrally housed that we can all use. Our organization is happy to do that. We've done that in the past. I know there are a couple others out there that are also happy to do that. Um, we really do, and frankly, and we need to get those messages out there. Uh, there are two, basically two advocacy groups that advocate for biomedical research in animals, and we're two very, very small groups. This is a team sport of advocacy, and it needs to be just more than the advocacy groups. It needs to be the uh, the universities, the pharmaceutical companies, etc. Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah. So my advice is just not to shy away from these topics. Don't let them scare you. Have the conversations. Bring up your work and your research, and let people ask you questions. Because as scientists, every day, you know, we're responsible for researching and providing rationale for questions that we have. Let these questions be about animal advocacy because. The model systems we use, we never know what we'll find, what we'll learn, what we can discover, and it all starts with just answering the unknown. And so, again, send an email to your scientific organization and please like join us in this effort. Thank you. Finally, Stefan. Yeah, to me is that uh, I think uh, what we brought together is that need that we have to speak more about animal research, but not just uh, North America, Europe, really at the global level. Uh, being able to to speak out, uh, you know, join forces, uh, whatever, tackle the question. Let's you know make a plan and let's do something about it. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists for a fabulous presentation and discussion, and I'd like to invite everybody to fill in the survey uh, to complete the survey, and uh, we'll take a look at the at the, uh, at the chats as questions that we didn't get time to and, and uh, learn, learn from uh, the excellent comments that people have put in the chat. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much and um, have a good rest of the day. Bye. Good evening, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.